A Most Beautiful Thing, is an extraordinary documentary film that chronicles the first African-American high school rowing team. Based on the inspiring book written by team leader Arshea Cooper, these young men are living and surviving on the west side in the 90s. Some are in rival gangs, others struggling with generational traumas, drug addiction, violence, and poverty. These are the young men that society says will never make it out alive. Each of these young men have the odds stacked against them through no fault of their own. And at a very early age, they must learn how to navigate and get through circumstances and instances that would easily break most adults. A Most Beautiful Thing offers stunning statistics and commentary on the roots of poverty, economic disparity, the war on drugs, and gang violence as it relates to how it affects the lives of our children. These young men sign up not knowing that they were about to experience a journey that would not only change their lives, but change their entire family trajectory. As you follow these men on their journey, you'll find yourself cheering them on as they reunite for one more race nearly 20 years later. The Chicago Defender had a chance to speak with team members Arshea Cooper, Ray Hawkins, and Alvin Ross about their incredible journey and the incredible film. Please meet the pride of the West Side, the men of the film A Most Beautiful Film. No, thank you. I, I'm a big fan of the Chicago Defender. So, you know, I remember being a kid, read, uh, you know, reading that, reading that uh, newspaper. So thank you. Thank you. I have to ask you guys, that moment where you guys are in the cafeteria as high school students and you see the boat and you eventually come back because they kind of get you with pizza. What <laughs> was it said that made you say, OK, pass the pizza. I'm going to sign up. <laughs> Once we once we got up there and we actually ate the pizza, you know, um, I was talking to my brother and we started, we was like, man, wait, let's just try it. Let's just do it. You know, it, it wasn't much said once we seen it. And we, even though some people can't swim, couldn't swim or whatever, we love to be in the water, you know? Mm -hmm. So we just like, Let, let's do it. Let's just, you know, and then they promised us that we would go places. We <laughs> definitely wasn't gonna pass that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, well, I think you were thinking you were about to be rolling, jet setting with new. Yeah, gym I know. <laughs> I'm like, what? You know? Yeah, but I think too, it was like it, it, Pookie. Said, Pookie has a unique uh, situation. He's the only person who who knew about the team and transferred over from a different school to be on the team. So his story is a little different than ours, but. Um, for, for me, uh, it was like, at first, you know, I, I saw the images on the TV monitor and I was like, no one looks like me. I'm not doing this. You know what I mean? I said no the first day. And then, uh, and then the second day, when I went upstairs, I think it was like, it was the coaches. It was just like their passion, you know? I, the first see a woman coach that's going to coach an all boys team. Like I was raised by women and most of the teachers I had were women. So I was very comfortable with that. And then to, mm -hmm. see, a, to see a black coach Right, showed me that um, in this white sport, I will possibly be protected in a way that we probably wouldn't have been if it was all white coaches. Right. And uh, and then the the one white coach had a lot of just passion and love. So I think that that for me, I was like, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of friends, or you know, I didn't make it on any other team. So I felt like this was something to to try. Well, when I came in later, it was to travel and to um, have a brotherhood, <laughs> just being around guys that 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 look like me, um, and just to get out of the city of Chicago. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Even when we went to Lincoln Park, it was just to get out of the community um, and explore. That was my whole thing, mm -hmm. exploration, just, just traveling. How did those moments on the water really kind of bring a sort of healing to some of the things that you guys have been dealing with in your personal life, some of the generational traumas? How did that help? Um, in starting that process? I think um, for me, like, you know, I, I heard gunshots when I, you know, when I slept and, and I skipped over pools of blood before I, we, I lost friends, 
um, and ran for my life, right? Uh, at the basketball court when there's shootouts. And so, you know, I always say that we experience what most soldiers have experienced in war, but before we were 15 years old. And so it's hard to really think into the future. And so being chased and dealing with all that stuff, I knew I wanted to be an athlete. So, but I tried out for football and it triggered a lot of that trauma. Like I wanted to fight or I want, or I wanted to hurt somebody when the coach was like, knock them dead, you know? Yeah. And if I tried out for basketball, it's a trash talking sport. I wasn't that good. And you hear things like you suck, you garbage that you heard growing up from people. And so you, you want to fight. And I think the fact that the sport was non-combative, non-conflict, um, and you out there and it's completely quiet and only one person could talk at a time, right? Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and the water just represent peace. So it was just because the constant motion over and over again, uh, and because it's remnant, it became meditative before a sport of competitiveness, right? And, and mm-hmm. so that actually, the sound of the blade hitting the water, the, 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 the waves in the water, it, it, it just became uh, uh, a, a place that reduced actually the trauma and it comes like the storms that we go through every day. And so uh, I think that's what helped me. And uh, it was downloading the serenity, right? Being able to breathe, no broken street glass, no police sirens, no screaming, mm-hmm. just being out there and, and, and connecting with each other. And uh, I think for me, that's why uh, the water was so important. And that kind of nature was uh, perfect for us. As for me, um, you know, being on the water, like I said, it's so peaceful out there. That was the only time I wasn't fighting. You know, that was the only time I wasn't, you know, looking to get in trouble and everything. It was about just, you know, being with being with my brothers and just out there and don't have to worry about anything. You know, we sat back and laughed so many times, like we, we just take a break and we start telling funny stories. And to make each other laugh, you know, and it, it start with, you know, Pookie G on back to me and Arche, you know, Preston Malcolm. And though that actually helped me because when I'm with my guys that, you know, the gang that I was in, when I'm with those guys, we don't tell funny stories. You know, only thing we're talking about it pretty much is like how to get more women and how to make more money or, you know, or look for somebody who we want to beat up or something, you know? But right. so being out there on that water, especially with these guys, you know, those, oh man, being out there with them was just, you know, that was so peaceful and calming to me. When I went home, I took that same energy home. I was always happy. I never left practice. I don't remember a day I left practice. Well, yes, I do. One time <laughs> that I left <laughs> and that, that's because they told us to run around the lagoon <laughs> twice. <laughs> and we didn't want to work out. <laughs> but other than that, you know, the, the water is so peaceful. That's why, you know, that's what brought me back there every single day. And to be with these guys, to hear their stories. And, you know, when we became, we, you know, we probably didn't like each other at all. And then we started loving each other really quick so that's what it did for me you know it brought me peace <laughs> it take alvin to give you a tearjerker <laughs> <laughs> um, for me once again to get out the community and, and get on that water it was no judgment zone we was all in the boat together as young black men and we have to trust each other because we have to learn how to swim even though we learned how to swim in the pool at school, some people still couldn't swim. <laughs> but we have to trust each other. And once mm-hmm. we got that trust, that's when the bond came. And as Alvin said, there was not one day that went past that we were not laughing. And I think mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of that laughter, it healed a lot of the wounds that we have to go back home and deal with because we would right, carry right. the laughter on to the next day. What I thought was really interesting and heartwarming about this story is the friendship, is the brotherhood that's formed because it is filled with you know, certain things that are happening in your life that are traumatic, traumatic backgrounds, but it's also filled with a lot of laughter 
and, you know, fun loving just moments between you guys. And you can really feel that energy and connection. And it's not something that is often shared. Um, that that story, that, you know, relationship between Black men um, that's not rooted in, you know, um, I want to say something toxic. Uh, it's fun. It's lighthearted. It's supportive. It's I got your back. I'm going to walk you to school and those kind of things. Could you speak about the friendship and, and the bond that you guys have had and how you've been able to sustain it? Um, 20 plus years later. Yeah, I started. I think it's, um, I think number one is that isolation, right? At a point you, you, you're you away from home. You don't have to prove anything to no one anymore. You don't have to be the cool guy. You just like, uh, you're around, you're in an all white space and you're saying to each other, all right, look around. We have to look out for each other. You know what I mean? We have to pull for each other. We have to connect. You know, you think about, like that, that alone really, really allowed us to, to, even if they didn't get along from different neighborhoods, like you had a race regatta and you're like, I had to go to the bathroom. Alvin, can you come with me? I'm not going by myself. Right. And so <laughs> conversations are happening be because of that. Right. And, um, and so I think also it was, it was the moms, right. That allowed us to go into each other's um, um, space right? And, and, and find something that's different, even if it's one thing that's not in our home. And so we find that one thing in that person's home, right? For Alvin, it was like that sense of loyalty at his house that I really admired, right? And for Pookie, mom, although she cursed me out, <laughs> it was like... Leave my it, mother it, out of this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was, you know, it, it showed up. Like, I, you know, Alvin was a protector. So I knew like at some point, like no one was going to beat me up because Alvin was there. Right. And so outside <laughs> of practice that, that love was shown. I remember one time I, I didn't have clothes to go to homecoming. Right. I didn't have any money for new clothes. My mom didn't have money. And Pookie had like this gift card and, and, and it, or if it was money, he, he was like, huh, here's, take it and buy something for homecoming. Right. So do we had that like bond outside of the sport you know what I mean? Because of the sport that really helped us connect and those things you don't forget. And it, it, it lasts forever. Like we hung out, us three hung out every day for a very long time outside of <laughs> after high school, you yes. know, and then we all lived together too after high school. <laughs> oh. we, we're not going to get into those stories, but, uh, you know, it, but it was all because of Rowan, you know, and so it's, it's, you, you, it's just like that, those soldiers who go to war many years ago, even back in the time where black and whites, the, you know, you know, didn't connect, right? But you were isolated, you were away from your country and you were fighting for each other, right? right? And you take that back home. And so that's kind of what it was like for us. I thought one of the funnier moments during the film is when you guys are trying to figure out, okay, how do we do this and still look like how we look? We're not wearing <laughs> this outfit. When you would, I think Al was like, you know, cause we in here, we kind of slow, you know? <laughs> 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 funny and so real because I with that's something my son would say like no I ain't wearing them tight pants I'm not doing this and just to watch you guys kind of navigate you know how are we going to do this and still remain true to us but still make sure we don't catch a crap in the middle of these races <laughs> uh, that was funny to, 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 to try to get around not wearing those tights. Each time they ended up, ended up with us losing the race, <laughs> you know, so, Can but I to, um, <laughs> I, I would have to say, I would have to say this. In the process, I, I think it was just something that was embedded in us. We had to stay true to ourselves. Right. We, we wasn't going to change even when we went to another state and we seen we were the only ones that that looked different. We still have to stay true to ourselves because we, at that point, we we were all we had. Right. So when Alvin cracked the jokes about about the shorts, we have to, we are different, and right. we and we accepted that. Yeah. So like for us stand together, you know, and one thing we all wanted, we all wanted the same thing, and we noticed that about each other. We all wanted to like. 
to laugh and be and be at peace. Mm -hmm. None of us had that. Like right. when you once you go home, like I didn't know Arshay's story. You know, we were so close. I didn't know Arshay's story. You know, um, about him not having food in the house sometimes. Right. You know, he used to come to our house. I, I he never said anything. You know, <laughs> I didn't know. And Preston, just say, for instance, Preston was out in the street. He different gang, but when he and Malcolm different gang, everyone, you know, when we all came together, none of that mattered. What which gang you in? What side of town you from? We just we instantly connected, and we just knew that this was gonna last for a very long time. And I loved Al your loyalty to your family and to your people. That was just, that's such a Chicago trait to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when, when we rock with y'all, we rock with you. That's that's how yeah. we get down. So I'm hoping that it opens Black America's eyes, middle-class Black America. It's very easy to look at kids who are out here wilding and doing X, Y, and Z and understand it is so many layers and I loved how the film really went all the way back to the layers that quite frankly, go right to the root of slavery and the great migration. Um, what we brought to the North <laughs> when we came from the South. And I thought listening to you guys and feeling what I got was, yeah, you guys have gone through some things, but at your core was loyalty was love, was endurance, you know, and this desire to do better and be better. Even when I'm making choices that aren't necessarily the right thing, there was a desire on the inside of you. And it really made me wonder, do we, do we give up on, on our young people too quickly without getting to the root of, of where the, the trauma is? That's a hell of a lot of trauma for to listen to each one of you say I was 10 or 11 when I first you know saw murder or knew somebody who was murdered that's I, not I, normal I, I think one of the things we have to realize you know from experience when it comes to kids kids have voices and we have to learn to listen to them and talk to them and you know like you say we have to see what they're going through not just saying, you know, don't say anything. Just, just do, do as I say, not as I, you know, what, what, what's the saying? Do, do as, as I, I say, not, not as, as I do. As I do. So you know, <laughs> we, we have to listen to our kids. You know, especially with the young, young, young black kids. My son, I don't just, you know, talk to him. I listen to him because sometimes it's when I, when I hear him, I hear, I hear a lot. You know. And I say, you know, explain yourself. Which, 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 mm -hmm. what do you mean? And mm -hmm. that gives him an outlet to to vent. You know, it, it's just not hush hush. But and I there's believe a lot of reading in between the lines. Yes. Because sometimes we our kids say things, but they don't go underneath yeah. the surface. <laughs> no, but that was a good. That was. A, I think that was a really good question uh Danielle because you I remember one teacher I think I was telling Alvin this what, what my um um uh, teacher said who said um she said Arche you uh you're not like the rest of them mm -hmm. um she said you're a good kid so you should you shouldn't hang out with them and I remember and we were here you know um pick these kind of friends to hang out with right so right mm -hmm. away those who have maybe a little bit more self-control um, and are leaders and was and, and really are kind of using a gift as a young age, which is we all have it, but some somehow had someone to help them bring it out a little bit more. They're not taught to reach out to Alvin or press. It's like stay away from them mm -hmm. and you stay in your group. My, My friends became people who were out there fighting, you know, who was like, you know, who was, who was terrorizing, who was, who was in the principal office all the time, that became my brotherhood, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but they had the same gifts, the same talents, right? Just not the access and opportunities that maybe some fell into, right? And so I think it's um, important for young leaders to be able to reach out and, and, and 
and, and in the same high school, in the same class, they'd be like, hey, let's, let's hang out, right? Or come to camp with me this summer or do this. You know what I mean? And so, but that's not really taught to the young person. And so mm-hmm. I think that uh, it'd be a little bit different if, if, if we teach young people can tap into that uh, kind of almost evangelistic spirit at a young age. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. I want to fast forward a little bit. So the moment you decide 20 years later, I'm going to get back in the boat. When I saw that, I was like, y'all, like y'all, y'all my age bracket, you know, our bones are a little, <laughs> everything don't work the way it did in high school. What, what made you say, this is what I want to do 20 years later and think, you know what, we can do this. Man. You know, for me, um, no, no, for me, uh, yeah, for me, I was like, I mean, I was like, man, we can, we can go back and we can win. All of us in pretty decent shape, you know, like I was like, man, we can, we can go back and probably win a race. I always had it in my mind. Back then we could have won it, but I feel like when, when they, when this opportunity came, I was like, man, I know we can get in shape and, re- and go and compete, you know? So um, like, I just just felt it. It, it. My body feel like right now. I feel yeah. My knees hurt sometimes. <laughs> you know? My back, my back kill me. But when we out there to do this to um, row, like I feel we can go and go. You know, and we can mm. still compete. Yeah, I, I still feel young. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I devil. I, that's that's what that's what got me. I was like, man, we still young. Let's do it. Yeah, and I think too the book was out for a little bit and. and- the mothers were either working two jobs or babysitting all the other kids or not around. And they knew this story changed our lives, but never was able to see it. Right. And I think mm-hmm. they felt guilty because of that. But a lot of ki- our kids heard about it and it was like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> so it was an amazing experience to unite these three generations, right? These, these yeah. generations um, uh, all together and, and to get families together to see it not only for us and our families, but for to inspire the city through, through, the, through mm-hmm. the sport and our stories. See all of your moms and family members at the, at the lakefront, you know, hanging out your kids. That had to be an incredible full circle moment for all of you. Yeah, my daughter was so, my daughter was so happy. Like, you know, and I didn't, I didn't really talk about rowing to them. So they really didn't know, you know, mm-hmm. my, my, my son, my daughter, they were just, so happy to see us doing it and to you know to get back out there and they was like man i can't believe y'all was doing this now now they now they want to try you know mm-hmm. so it was man that feeling of going back yeah. to compete to let and i played i played chess tournament chess from fourth grade you know up to high school and my father no one ever came to one single chess match with a chess tournament you know, and that was the same with Ron. No one ever came. But to have all our family out there this time and friends, like people were showing up like, man, I, how you know about it? You know, man, I wanted to see mm-hmm. y'all race. You know, yeah. to have that, you know, everybody in behind us, it just made me feel like a kid again. You know, it just, man, it was exciting. And that feeling of acceptance from your people. You know, I I was telling a friend of mine, I said, if I was, because I walked down the lakefront a lot, I said, if I was walking and I saw a group of Black people rowing, I'm stopping. I would stop (laughs) just because it's something I had never seen before. I'd be like, what's going on? (laughs) Yeah, and that's what happens on, like, when we, on a uh, rowing, even practicing to the race, Black people were honking their horns. Yeah. One of the things I that threw me for a loop where I literally was shouting at the TV was when you said you wanted to to bring the police to race. And so when you said, I thought this would be a good idea. And I was like, you know, I kind of <laughs> had a moment. Did you all have the same moment when our Shea brought this to you? Like, <laughs> you know, I had the same moment. <laughs> yeah, we all did. Because <laughs> I'm thinking like, with if I've had personal involvement that's negative, with the police, the last people I want in the boat with me is some of the same, you know, 
people that may have been instrumental in locking me up or causing me drama throughout my, you know, teenage years. Arshe, what was the motivation behind that? And how did you <laughs> sell that? <laughs> um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cash. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it was, um, I th- there's two things that scares a mother, especially on the West side of Chicago. They, their son interaction in a different neighborhood and his son interaction with the cops. How, yep. can, how can I eliminate both, right? I spent my life really eliminating one, right? Trying to make sure that, you know, the neighborhood is as best as it can be. So our mothers don't have that fear. And um, I think for me, it honestly is, it wasn't my first time. I was young and I had a barbecue invited cops. So I don't know if you remember that, Alvin, uh, you know, as, as an 18 year old kid. And I think for me, I, I'm thinking about if you're going to work, we, I will protest and I have and done a many, a, so many different things. But at the end of the day, when we wake up tomorrow, those cops still have to work eight hours interacting with our teenage kids, right? Mm-hmm. And they need to know our names, right? And you saw the film. How can you not be around these guys and not be moved by them? So how right. can I get, create an opportunity where they understand the people in our community. And so number one, it was, as a teacher, you will always forget some of your students, but as a student, you will never forget your teacher. And we had an opportunity to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like, you know, in, in order to, ref, you know, find alignment, you have to refocus the lens. So how do the way they see Alvin, how do they see Pookie, how do they see Malcolm? So how, and so I invited them out and I wanted to bring them to the same water where we didn't get along at first 20 years ago mm. and, and create an opportunity to experience that spirituality. Because at the end of the day, what they learned and I learned, we got a group chat with them. And I'll tell you some of the stuff they said, I've, you know, this was before George Floyd was murdered, but you know, we do experience trauma living on the West side of Chicago due to segregation, slavery and Jim Crow laws, right? And yep. those cops do, you know, they cause a lot of problems and pain And they do experience some of the same PTSD, but it's all a result of slavery, segregation laws, right? And so the way to have that conversation and that uncomfortable conversation, which we had, we had to train together, work out together, uh, face the same fears, have the same goals, right? And And what they learned is that Alvin grew up not making bad choices, but hard choices to survive, right? Right. They knew that Malcolm calls his son every 10 minutes, that black men love their fathers, right? That Preston wears his hoodie and sag his pants, but he's one of the best entrepreneurs over there. Uh, You know what I mean? Like they learned this day by day and they wouldn't have got it if I just mailed them my book, right? Right. And and so uh, I wanted to create that opportunity. And again, like I said, it doesn't change the system, right? But I know when they wake up the next morning, they know Alvin's name, my name, and our kid's name. Because that scene with the fathers and their kids in the tanks, they mm-hmm. were there actually for that. They saw wow. that. So they never got seen anything like it before. Right. And, um, and so, and the last thing I'll say is that after George Floyd was murdered, to, to see Big Lou post a Chicago cop, yes, Black Lives Matter on Instagram. These are the things that you don't see at protests, right? right. Have Officer Carol send me a photo Talk, meeting with black activists, right? Um, and then Matt, who was probably like my favorite cop, and Al was probably favorite cop, for him to say, you know, when George Floyd was murdered, they threw, I got bricks thrown at me. And he said that, but what I realized is that I can take my uniform off, but you can't take your black skin off. And I said, mm. I said, you're right, but I need you to tell that to your buddies. Right. Exactly. And so, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was standing on the opposite side of the street shouting. Right. And although there's, there's moments that we should do that, I wanted to create a moment that we had 20 years ago and to see if, if it will work. Mm-hmm. They learn from you and then you guys learn from them. I love right. the moment where you, one of the cops says, you know, we're in the same boat, literally. So it's yeah. a literal and figuratively, you know, kind of comparison. So I need to ask you, did your kids know your story, your background, your family's background before this film came out? And if they haven't, 
after watching it, what are what are your kids saying about what you guys have done? Uh, for me, my son, he didn't believe it <laughs> because you're so busy being a parent. You know that mm-hmm. that was like a past life. Yeah. So when when he heard about it and he's seen it for himself, he was he was amazed. He was he was very mm-hmm. proud and happy. Um, yeah, for me, my daughter, you know, my son, I always talk to them. I have real conversations with them since, uh, since a young age, you know, and especially my daughter, I really talk to her about life, period. She knows everything about me. I tell her everything. I try to tell her things. So if she feels like she's going through it, she can look back and say, man, my dad, told me he did this before, uh, something like that. So she won't make certain mistakes. But I didn't tell, what I didn't tell him, I didn't tell him about what my dad was doing. You know, mm. I, and, um, I didn't tell them, I just let them watch the movie. I, di- I didn't even tell them before. And they mm. just cried and cried. All my nieces, my nephews and my kids, they just cried and cried because they didn't, they didn't know. You know, mm. I didn't want them to have that, you know, they they knew my dad, you know what I'm saying? They are, they call him dad or whatever. They had that, they had this, you know what I'm saying? Oh, granddad love us, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, picture in their mind, that's what they knew. I didn't want to like tarnish that. So mm-hmm. I just let, I, you know, once they watched the film then, and we talked about it afterwards, you know, but they didn't know, I didn't talk too much. They didn't even know I was rowing in school until, I should have wrote the book, <laughs> you know. Wow. I don't know why I didn't tell them about that part, but 20 years ago, we didn't know it mattered neither. Mm. But look now, it matters. <laughs> That's interesting because it literally changed the courses of your lives, you know, and put, I love Arche where you talk about your family and how this experience literally was a catalyst to bring everybody in your family out of generational trauma and certain choices. You become an entrepreneur, owning your own business, being able to employ people in your community. It's been this domino effect of good, you know, in, in each of your lives, even with the struggles that have come in between. At the end of the day, this has been transformative. Um, like you said, that goes way beyond rowing on a team. It's transformed your lives and your family's lives and really kind of cease that cycle of, of generational curses that we tend to carry in our families. And it's been layers of that. What does it feel like to know that's on you guys? You guys did that for your families and that's part of your legacy. Well, it feels it feels really it feels really good to me. Like because of because of everything that's happening now, because that I'm like I don't care about being on you know Amazon Prime and everything. I don't care about people saying, "Oh man, you got a movie out." It's about helping every like touching, changing lives, and helping young people. Or it doesn't helping older people. Everybody mm-hmm. look that's um, been reading the book and listening to this story and following this story like they own they say the same stuff like you're changing lives man think god blessing you in so many ways you're gonna do great things you know i don't care i don't want the fame but if my story helped change some someone man i'm, I'm there I'm, I'm all for it yeah no it's the same with alvin i think it's just you know it, it, it feels great to just in inspire the, the next generation, you know, I think to go out there and tell our stories and, and, um, you know, and, and have people change because of it, you know, it, it fires you up and, uh, you know, put us in a position where we know that we could do more, right? There's still a lot of people don't know our story. Uh, but again, it feels great, but it, it's that reassurance that uh, there's still more work to do and we have the power to do even more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one one thing again that I left out. Um, so I do like I have um, I have a moving company. So I go back 
I'm in my neighborhood every single day, you know, and I, I'm taking all the guys, who, anyone who wants to work, all the young guys. I have guys that was that I was in the game with calling me and asking me to um, put their sons to work. You know, mm-hmm. even even some of them come and work with me. So yeah. it feels good to like um, to go back to the community and be like, "Hey, man, y'all come work for me." You know, I don't. I, I never say work for me. I always say work with. Me. You know, because I actually get out there and I move with my guys. Mm-hmm. You know, anything they do, I'm going to do it with you every single day. I don't just send guys here and there. I work with my guys. And that feels, you know, that makes them feel good about the money that they're making. And it makes me feel good about, you know, helping these guys out in the neighborhood. Even even some on the south side, it doesn't matter where you're from, you know, as long mm-hmm. as you can get to get to the work site. So it made me feel good, you know, that I'm actually helping, you know, helping people and changing, like changing lives. What can we do as a community to reach them and put them on a path the same way someone puts you on a path by just offering you pizza in a conversation? You know, what are, what's something that we can do? I would, I would say to change the narr- narrative, it might be pizza in a conversation. Mm-hmm. And put put programs <laughs> in in a, in a place where the kids feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know what's going on in these kids' home. You know, un- until they're they're in front of you and you might see a bruise or something. Um, it I would say put more programs available to the kids and the right people yeah. that's um, that's in charge of the programs. You know, I think the same way, and I I also think. It takes people like us that if I if I go in, you know, into my community, the, the neighborhood I grew up, the guy people still respect me around there. If I start to, if I had cameras behind me or a microphone and started talking and telling them a story, people will come to listen. So mm-hmm. I feel if if they had these programs in place and they invited people like us from the neighborhood, you know, yeah. that you know, that they don't have to know us personally, but their family might know us there. Their uncle, auntie, grandmother, or something like that. I feel that they, you know, if we put more people that they can, can relate to, you know, and so we can insert ourselves in their lives, I think we can touch a lot of people. Because, you know, everybody, all of everyone has a story, you know, yeah. a story to tell. So if, if we can go and start, and they hear our story and they hear each every every story is different but it's all something that it's something that they're going through too yeah i think um yeah a couple of things i think um um one of the powerful things for me it was in the barbershop when Pooh said um uh, when they um shut down the ymca i ran to the streets yeah and uh, Alvin knows that YMCA. Um, it's like, you know, 150 kids there. Now they lost funding. It's 150 kids out in the street, right? And then now you have the guy on the corner and saying, hey, I bought your first pair of shoes. You know what I mean? And you're just looking for love. You're looking for an opportunity, right? Uh, a father figure or a big brother figure, right? And, and, and you'll find it if it's not in, in the places that we offer as a safe place, right? So I think that continue to fight for the access. And obviously I know people who started like little checkers clubs and a little portion of, uh, of a gym, right? So how do we get more people to use their talent, their, their skills, their treasure uh, to give 10 to 20 kids an opportunity to learn from them, even if it's in a church office, right? So empowering our people to do that. I think number two is, um, you know, again, like, I love the fact that you guys are defending, right? The, the narrative. And I remember before the story hit the screen, reaching out to WGCI, like all these Chicago places, like, this is our story, tell a story. It took 20 years to tell the story, but there's so many more people stories in Chicago. And, uh, and it's either no or how much money you have and didn't respond and you listen to the radio show and they talking about R. Kelly. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's so much yeah. good news to put out there and the stories that would inspire people and stories that would help people to face 
their demons and their yes. fears, right? So how can we promote or create opportunities to promote this story? We wouldn't go to therapy, but we would sit and talk about this, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think, how, how, how do we, uh, you know, create the opportunities? I think the last thing is, you know, the, the biggest lesson I learned in Rowan is that when I showed up and they said, leave the boathouse better than you found it. And I'm like, I didn't make the, I didn't make this mess. Right. You know, and it says, you know, even if you didn't make the mess, it makes it easier for the next group that comes in. And I think individually with our friends, our church members, our kids, ourselves, our peers, if we can challenge them to leave the classroom, um, their friends, their zoom meetings, their, uh, their block, their Mm -hmm. neighborhood better than they found it. Um, it makes it easier for the next generation. Even if you, you may say, and that's the one thing you say, oh man, her and her kids, they're a mess. Well, that church mm-hmm. is hot mess. Like, like, even if you didn't make the mess, you, there's a responsibility, I believe, to leave it better than you found it. Like, I want my block to be better because I'm here, right? And, and, and when you leave Earth, they would say, because of her, this program was created or this block was like this. And so how do we empower individuals around us to, to, to live a, a life in that way, even? And so that's how I live my life, right? Even when you disagree, like if I yeah. feel like the cops should know my guy's name and their kid's name, I'm going to do it because it's, it's better for my block. No, I cannot tell you how moved I was and, and impacted. It, it caused some conversations in my own family. Um, awesome. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. These men made a decision to get in a boat and learn lessons that changed the course of their entire life. A Most Beautiful Thing is one of the most inspiring stories you will see. It's an incredible source of pride not only for the West Side, but for the entire city. You can stream A Most Beautiful Thing on Amazon Prime Video and purchase the book written by Arshay Cooper on Amazon Prime and other online bookstores. For more on this story, please visit our website, www.chicagodefender.com.